Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to go over a macro topic. We're going to be evaluating one of the limitations of fiscal policy, and one of those limitations is something called crowding out. So let's just make a note here that we're looking at a weakness. All right, this is a weakness of fiscal policy. We want to remember that fiscal policy is dealing with the central government, separate from the central bank. Okay? And we know that the central government can control taxes and it can control government spending. Now, in the case of expansionary fiscal policy, the government may want to increase government spending, and if they don't get an increase in tax revenue, they'll have to borrow that money. So we're going to illustrate a money market graph and an ADAS uh, macro graph to illustrate crowding out. So here let's label that graph A is the money market. And graph B is the national economy. We're using an ADAS model to illustrate what's happening to aggregate demand. So um, in the money market, we have a perfectly inelastic supply of money. So we'll draw that here. This will be SM1 supply of money one and we're going to have a demand for money that's downward sloping and the intersection of the two sets the equilibrium interest rate so here's the demand for money dm1 and supply of money that sets an equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded of money at qm1 quantity of money supplied at and demanded and then we have that equilibrium interest rate set. Okay. We'll call that IR1, interest rate 1, at point A. Okay. Now on the uh, ADAS model, we're going to be illustrating a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. which we're going to label 81. And we're going to remember that 81 is equal to consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus net exports, or exports minus imports. And then we're going to have an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. Let's choose another color here. OK. So this will, we'll just label AS or short run aggregate supply, that's fine too. SRAS, okay? And we know that the intersection of the two creates an equilibrium. I'll call it, this would be AB, let's we'll just call this point C. At point C, that sets an equilibrium uh, level of output, real GDP, and we'll call that Y1. And that sets an equilibrium price level here, and we'll call that PL1, average price of goods and services within the economy, okay? So this is our starting point. We have a money market. We're looking at the supply and demand for money, which sets an interest rate. And in the national economy, we're looking at aggregate demand, intersecting with short and aggregate supply, setting a level of output at Y1 with an equilibrium level of, uh, or equilibrium price level at PL1. So if the central government wants to engage in expansionary fiscal policy, Perhaps the economy is in recession and they want to increase government spending. And they're not going to, and let's assume that they're not going to increase tax revenue. So there's no revenue coming in, but they want to spend more. That's going to cause the government to borrow. In order to shift out aggregate demand by increasing government spending, the central government will have to go to the money market to borrow money. So thus the demand for money is going to increase from DM1 to, let's say, DM2.
that increased demand by the central government will increase the rate of interest. So now we see that the equilibrium rate of interest has risen from IR1 to IR2. So the government has increased their demand, sets a new equilibrium at point B, rate of interest has risen, and due to that uh, increased borrowing, the central government can now engage in expansionary fiscal policy. So AD shifts out from 81 to, let's say, 82. They are borrowing and now they're spending. Government spending is increasing and we get an increase in aggregate demand from 81 to 82. That sets an increased level of output from Y1 to Y2. And it also leads to demand pull inflation. The price level rises from PL1 to PL2. All right, if we're going from point B to point uh, from point C, I'm sorry, to point D. Due to that increased aggregate demand by government spending, firms respond by increasing the quantity of their aggregate supply along the SRES curve. And as they increase their outputs, they're going to hire more resources like labor, and thus unemployment falls. We get more output from Y1 to Y2, and we get demand pull inflation. Now, there's a problem with this. If the quantity of money is fixed at SM1, and interest rates have risen, yes, government spending has increased, but it crowds out. It pushes out households from borrowing and spending and firms from borrowing and spending because the interest rate is too high, perhaps. So as a result of an interest rate rising, we see perhaps that consumption spending is falling and potentially investment spending is falling. And that can lead to AD shifting in, let's say from 82 to... 83. So even though, let's see if we can uh, illustrate this, we'll use this color. We have 81 shifting out to 82. That's the government spending. We have 82 shifting into 83 due to the fall in consumption and investment spending. And that's what we call partial crowding out. Now, if consumption investment spending fell by the same amount uh, as the increase in government spending, then you could have 82 shifting back to 81. So you're right back where you started. And that's what we call, I believe it's called a complete crowding out. Okay, so I'm going to analyze this. Uh, as we would for a paper one exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs uh, illustrating the concept of crowding out. In graph A, we're looking at a money market. In graph B, we're looking at a monetarist model illustrating aggregate demand and aggregate supply. In graph A, we're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis and the rate of interest on the y-axis. And in graph B, we're measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. In graph A, we have a perfectly inelastic supply of money labeled SM1, perfectly inelastic because at any one point in time, there's only a fixed quantity of money in circulation, and we have two downward sloping demand for money curves labeled DM1 and DM2. In graph B, we have uh, three downward sloping aggregate demand curves labeled 81, 82, and 83 in accordance to the wealth effect uh, or the interest rate effect or the um, international trade effect. And we have an upward sloping shore and aggregate supply curve. All right, upward sloping because as price level rises, profits for firms increase. Thus, it, thus it, it incentivizes firms to increase the quantity of their output. In graph A, we have an equilibrium where DM1 equals SM1, providing an equilibrium uh, rate of interest at point A or at IR1 with an equilibrium quantity supply and demanded for money at QM1. We're going to assume that in graph B, we will be starting where 81 equals SRS1 at point C, providing a price level at PL1 and an equilibrium level of real GDP at Y1. The 
uh, central government wants to engage in expansionary fiscal policy. Perhaps the economy is in recession and they don't want to increase tax revenue, so they're going to have to borrow funds to increase government spending. Thus, in the money market, we see an increase in the demand for money by the central government from DM1 to DM2. That sets a new equilibrium where DM2 equals SM1 at point B, increasing the rate of interest from IR1 to IR2. And we notice that the quantity supply demanded is, uh, is unchanged. This borrowing by the central government allows them to increase government spending. Thus, 81 shifts out to 82. And where 82 equals SRS1 at point D, we see a rise in the price level from PL1 to PL2. This is demand pull inflation. And we see an increase in real GDP from Y1 to Y2. That increased aggregate demand leads firms to employ more resources as they increase the quantity of their aggregate supply. But the higher rate of interest at IR2 makes it more difficult for households and firms to borrow and spend. So we notice that consumption spending falls, investment spending falls, and thus aggregate demand too decreases to 83. We're moving from point D to point E. And that reduces the price level from PL2 to PL3 and reduces GDP from Y2 to Y3. So let's go ahead and label that. Here's PL3, and here we are at Y3. So uh, as a result of reduced consumption investment spending, 82 shifts in towards 83, reducing the price level from PL2 to PL3, and reducing real GDP from Y2 to Y3. As a result of the decrease in aggregate demand, firms begin to decrease the quantity of the aggregate supply, and they will have to fire some unemployed resources like labor. This is what we call partial crowding out. It's also possible that aggregate demand two can shift all the way back to 81, reducing the price level from PL2 back to PL1 and real GDP from Y2 back to Y1. That's what we would call complete crowding out. So that is a weakness of fiscal policy um, as a result of the government increasing the demand for money, raising the interest rate, and crowding out or pushing out household and investment spending. Now, how can this be solved? Um, quick solution is that the central government works with the central bank, and the central bank engages in expansionary monetary policy to keep the interest rates down. So if they were to do that, we would see perhaps the interest rate going, being maintained at IR1 as a result of the central bank increasing the supply of money from SM1 to SM2. And we notice that the interest rate has maintained itself at IR1. So even though we see an increase in demand for money by the government, if they coordinate with the central bank and the central bank engages in expansionary monetary policy, they can maintain a low interest rate and thus not crowd out investment and household spending. Okay? So I'm just going to mark that right here. So that's typically what we see, and that's currently what's happening with the COVID pandemic. Yes, central governments are borrowing heavily and spending into the economy, but at the same time we see the central bank increasing the supply of money to maintain low interest rates to not crowd out investment and uh, household or consumption spending. Okay? And, uh, and that's it. That's how we would explain crowding out. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.